Hey all, Aaron Chapman, Security National Mortgage Company. I thought I'd give you a little bit cooler background here. This is uh, my Jeep. I was out running this thing this last weekend, trying to do a little bit something different here. And you know, I'm not really liking the way this is, you know, pixelating or whatever. So I'm gonna shut that off and we're just gonna keep talking here. Um, so ultimately what I wanna do is basically try and give you a little bit of background of what's going on nowadays. What's happening with the mortgage-backed securities market why is it that you're looking at the uh, mortgage news daily charts that I had talked about last week and, and you're seeing things improving? You're like, wow, I'm not seeing the alerts from Aaron though, that now's the time to lock. There's a lot more going on than what we were aware of at the time. You know, we're just, you know, we in the industry are looking at these things, you know, you know plummeting. And from all the history we've ever had, you start seeing those markets do that. All this uncertainty, well, then, of course, that's the explanation as to why the rates are going up. Now they're going, you know, going the other direction. Like, okay, well, wh wh where's, our, where's our rate at? Well, you start finding more and more and more out. More stuff starts to bubble to the surface when we're not getting the pricing as far as the rates to us that we believe would have been coming. So what has happened here is we're seeing a lot more uh, damage uh, being done by the whole craze of low rates. So what we what we have discovered is that with the Fed lowering the rate, the Fed doing everything they can to buy mortgage-backed securities, pump stimulus into the market, get interest rates down, it's created that frenzy of demand, right? We talked about the demand thing, supply, demand. Well, supply is there, demand is there, but the bigger problem is is with the unintended consequences. So let's kind of go through what this looks like uh, getting a loan. So you as a as an individual buying a home you're going to work with a mortgage loan originator such as myself to write that loan. They're gonna quote you interest rates and go through the process of gathering paperwork, get your approved for that loan. And when it's funded, uh, that money will actually come from you know, the Wall Street investment pool to, to take care of that, that loan. And how that works more or less is they're gonna lock that rate, right? But when they lock that rate, that's gonna to go to a specific source. There's dozens of sources that we have access to. Well, they're going to promise to provide that loan amount at that rate to you at the time that you close. And when that's provided to you, they're basically hoping the market stays the same or better so they can, they can uh, uh, profit from that. Well, then once that loan is funded and closed, it goes on to a servicer. And quite often, you're, you have seen where people sell the loans and you're making a payment to somebody else. That's the servicer. Not the, they're not, they don't own the loan. That's a servicer. What that does is then that servicer is going to be packaging all that up. All that loans are, are packaged and sent into a bundle to, uh, to an aggregator like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, those, those folks. And they're going to take it from there and they're going to put bigger packages together and sell them through the mortgage-backed securities pools on Wall Street. That's a basic idea of where it goes. There's probably several steps in there, but I'll give you an, uh, an overview of what it's like. Well, then that gets kind of pushed into pension funds, into 401ks, IRAs, other, other uh, fund accounts. And that's really being purchased by everybody, the, cons the, the investment uh, consumers across the globe, whether it be uh, you individually in your retirement accounts or other large organizations are purchasing that. Now, what's happening here is that servicer is going to pay a premium to have the right to collect the money, collect the taxes, the insurance, and make sure the loan is taken care of. They're going to get a piece of that every single year. Now, the piece of that is less than a third of the uh, interest that's collected, but they're going to pay a chunk of money up front. Let's say 1% of the loan amount, let's just say. So if it's a $100,000 loan, they're going to pay 1000 bucks to have the right to collect, right? And that right to collect, basically, is they're going to collect one-third of the payment. So let's say it's, you know, it's going to take them three years to get enough money in the little piece that they collect just to break even on what they pay to have access to service your loan. If you pay off that loan, you refinance, do a rate and term refi. You probably called a lender and say, hey, the rates went down, I want to refinance. If you've owned that property or that last loan for less than three years, it's now costing the servicer to give the payoff and pay off that note. They're actually losing money, right? So in a normal business environment, that's not going to kill them. But let's think about where we sit today. We sit in a situation where people are being you know, quarantined more or less, you know, or, you know, the social distancing, work from home. Some jobs you can't work from home. There's people losing jobs. If that's the case, we also have you know, the, the plan in place where the government says, hey, we're going to let you have a, if you can't make your payment, we're going to have them set up some sort of 
way to be able to help you to not make that payment and not nail you on your, your credit. But the service girl still has to pay the end owner of that note. They promised them, say, hey, here's your, here's your 1%, and we're going to always collect. We're going to make sure you're always paid. Well, if you're not paying them, but they still have to pay for it, what's happening? Now you start to see the big problem that's starting to, to, to grow. One, they already have everybody wanting to refi way ahead of the time before they even break even. So they're losing money there. And now we have the, the, the big risk of a lot of people not being able to pay their mortgage. That's huge. Let's go back to 2008. People couldn't pay their mortgage because the interest rates are through the roof and they couldn't afford it to begin with. So we shored all that up by being sure that we weren't giving loans to people who couldn't afford it. We, there's, there's laws in place, right? If you can't afford it, you can't have it, right? But now we have this massive impact to our economy called the coronavirus. Now think what's happening here. Now we have taken all this, these precautions to avoid putting people in homes that couldn't afford it. But on top of that, now we have this whole big plague, if you will, that's, that's potentially impacting many people's ability to pay their loans. Not only that, you know, renters maybe may not have the ability to pay their rent. Therefore, people who own investment properties may not be able to pay their mortgages unless they ran their business properly in advance. That's a whole other conversation. But think about the domino effect. Now you have these massive pools of loans that are being impacted as far as the companies who are servicing them. They're losing money. Well, we'll get back to mortgage-backed securities. Get back to what we're looking at on the um, on uh, Mortgage News Daily. Look at those charts. All this influx of capital, rates are not going down. Why? Because if the more you attract people to pay off these loans, the more money they lose, right? So they're not going to offer anything they don't have to offer right now. we got we got to quell this a little bit. So if you've ever called me and said, hey, rates just went down, what should I do? I've got this $70,000 investment property. I've got this loan out there. Could I get a better rate? You probably heard me tell you, no, refinancing for rate is never, ever, ever a good plan unless you're pulling cash to expand your holdings, right? Just doing it for rate costs you way too much money. It's not worth it. And then on top of it now, because of all of that, everybody who's demanding that, look, we're doing, we're crippling an industry again. And not only the crippling industry, we're doing even worse damage than what was done during the 2000, 2008 situation because that was mainly a lot of your subprime stuff. This is the prime stuff. This is the people that went through all the qualifying process. So just think, man, if we don't slow down, we don't back up just a little bit. We as consumers dig in and say, I want my rate, I want my rate, I want my rate. I get it. But at the same time, you're not going to have loans, period, if we don't back off just a little bit. Loan originators who sell on rate, guys, stop that shit. I'm serious. Just getting out there and say, hey, the rate's just dropped in me refi. You're calling your database for refinancing? Guys, that's, we need to calm that down. If it's not putting a person in a position to expand their holding somewhere, I don't make that call. So this is my opinion. It's not my company's opinion. This is me just saying we need to quit this. We need to back off this stuff. We're crippling a side of our economy that shouldn't be going through this. So let's talk about where we might be going. I'm hoping we're not going there, but could be going there, right? Interest rates have gone up. They, they're going to stay there until we can get control of this whole thing. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about here and share is – Guys, rates going up is not bad. It's not going to kill you, especially you real estate investors. You guys can take advantage of two things, right? What you're trying to avoid is compound interest eating up your profits, right? And eating up your 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 cash. So you know, Einstein called it the eight of the world compound interest. But we live in an inflationary environment. And many of you have heard me talk about this. I'm going to talk about it again. I'm going to show you the chart that I use to reference this. My buddy Johnny John Abernathy, Dr. John Abernathy over at uh, Kennesaw State University, worked with his students and some of his other professors, created this for me. I'll get this out to the whole world soon, but just know that this is coming. But here's, take a look at this. This is amazing. We, us living in an inflationary environment, go to the chapwoodindex.com, go to um, shadowstats.com and look under their tab of alternate data and look at how inflation really is. It's not the Fed's 1.5 or 2%. It, we're looking at over 8 to 10% inflation in many cases. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick share screen here so we can look at this chart together. And, and on this chart, what I want you to take a look at here is we're going, to, we're going to call it 6% for 30 years. You know, up here where my cursor is at, right? So if you look at that 6%, you know, ignore the start date here. We're going to go with today, you know, 3-26-2020, and I'm in the wrong spot.
So 326, 2020, that's the start date of this loan, 6%, right? We're gonna talk about an investment property of a $100,000 loan, a purchase price with $80,000 loan. So, so when we're looking at this, we're thinking, okay, if you go into the principal and interest, that's $478.64 a month. For 30 years, that's you've got a business partner going to put up $80,000 for you to buy your business, your, your $100,000 business here. It's going to generate revenue for you. You can rent this thing for $1,000 a month typically, right? All they want is $479.64, right? Well, you're going to have taxes and insurance, but let's say you're going to make $200 a month in cash flow after all expenses. That's pretty darn good. But what you're going to stress about, because, and I know you are because you always call me about this, is right here at the bottom line. You got $80,000 in principal you got to pay back, right? your tenants paying back in reality. At 6%, you're paying $92,670.55 in interest over 30 years. That's where you're freaking out. You're saying, I'm paying 172 for this property when I figure out all the money that I've paid. That sucks, and I get it. Those numbers are really, really big in your head. But one thing that we don't consider often is that we live in this inflationary environment. And the rate of inflation, especially you folks in Northern California, man, is kicking your ass. You know. 12%, 13%. There's some big inflation numbers out there. Go back to those websites I talked about, shadowstats.com and the chapwoodindex.com. Digest that data. Let's say the average inflation across the United States for the real estate investor is about 7%. That means the dollar is losing its buying power at that, that rate or higher for, in reality based upon what people are spending their money on. If we're talking about toilet paper right now. It's a hell of a lot worse than 7% inflation, believe so what we've got here is 7%. I plug that in here. And if we recalculate every single dollar as you're making a payment for 30 years, the same 479.64 every single month for 30 years, you're not paying the $80,000 in, in principal. You're not paying the $92,000 in interest. You're paying $72,093.59 in actual dollar value. This is ESOP's tortoise and the hare thing kicking ass, right? Tortoise paying very, very slow. So I say leverage high, leverage long, and pay slow, but pay. You no, know, pay your mortgage. You're, you're not even paying them back what you borrowed. It's an amazing opportunity here. Just got to get your mind right. Got to wrap your head around these things properly. You get to raise rents to pace inflation, right? They don't get to raise the payment on the loan because of inflation. When you're raising rents, even at a 3% on this, this deal here, $100,000 property, $1,000 a month uh, rent payment, and you get to raise it for 3%, that's 30 bucks, right? 30 bucks is not sexy. Nobody gets out of bed for $30. You poor Northern Californian, that's two lattes, right? $30. Well, if you are $200 a month in cash flow and it went from 200 to 230, you got a 15% increase in your cash flow. That's a compound effect, right? Well, and you're paying it back with a declining instrument. You're not giving them back what they even borrowed and yet you get to raise your income. Think about these things as you're considering what the interest rate is. One last story before we close this puppy up, you got to think about. And I may share these a hundred times to remind people you got to keep hearing it, you got to keep hearing it, that interest rates don't matter. Back in 2017, I had a client win the contract on two properties, both brand new build homes, same street, same floor plan, same potential rent, same price in Memphis, Tennessee. One was just about finished being built. The second one, they'd yet to break ground. So one was a house that they are doing the trim work on. One was an empty lot. Closed on the first one, December of 2017 for 4.75% interest rate. Great deal, right? Then we got into the next one after the Fed, the new Fed chairman, Jerome Powell, did quantitative tightening, which is they're doing the quantitative easing, which is what he's doing right now. Pumping money into mortgage-backed securities, bringing the rates down. Well, then they said, well, we're going to stop that. They stopped putting money in. I mean, we're averaging from what I looked at. I mean, it, it's probably right around $20 billion a month was going into the mortgage-backed securities pools to keep the, the, the rates down, the supply high, right? Well, they backed off of that, trickled it down to like $100 million over a few months. Well, you get to May of 2018. After all that effect, interest rates are now 5.75, so 1% higher in rate. He's ready to close on property number two. Remember, same price, same floor plan, same rent, same street, same everything, but in the same cost. He pretty much put out the same amount of money out of his pocket, but it was a higher rate. So the difference in payment was $49.97, almost 50 bucks. So this gentleman called me up and says, man, I'm losing $600 a year by buying this property. I'm like, how are you losing 600? He says, well, if you take the difference in payment, 
you round up that few cents, that's $50 a month, 12 months, 600 bucks difference. I don't think I'm going to buy the property. I'm like, well, let's talk about this a second. You trust me to be an advisor at your board table, you know, albeit figuratively. Why don't you call your CPA and ask them a couple questions before you come to a decision, right? Don't even take my word for it. Call your CPA. What is the difference in the taxes you will pay on the increased income of property number one versus property number two? Then ask them what is the difference in the tax deduction you're going to get on property two with the higher interest rate versus property one? And remember, your tenant's paying the taxes anyway. You get to deduct what somebody else is paying. So he went ahead and contacted the CPA. And um, three days later, calls me up and says, hey, let's go ahead and close. I'm like, why are we closing? I said, well, when I recalculate with my taxes, he'd just done taxes. This is May, right? So he'd done his taxes in April. So we're going to recalculate everything based on what I pay in, in taxes on the income versus what I get in a deduction for the higher rate. It's no longer $49.97. He was in the living in California, had a really, really good income, was you know, blessed with high taxes of California and the Fed, but ultimately said the difference was $3.55 a month. So let's move forward. Very inconsequential, guys. So remember, this is a business. Don't worry about the cash flow on the monthly basis. Worry about how does it translate out when you do all angles of this, right? So that's just a couple things to think about. Kick around your head as you're looking forward. You know, those of you who have locks right now, I know you might be getting a little bit fearful and say, maybe I don't move forward. Just know that anytime you have a lock loan and you don't close on that and it cancels that, that's another impact to the mortgage industry. That's another loss somewhere that's going to be promised to return on that investment they still have to pay. So remember, it impacts a lot every time we move one direction or the other. Refinancing within three years is not really helping you that much. It really isn't that cost. We can get into this at another time. My next one, I'll talk about that first five years of the amortization table. Look up an amortization table in the meantime. We'll talk about that next time. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate you and I appreciate the awesome feedback, the notes, the, the texts, the emails, the phone calls. Guys, I'm going to do my best to bring you, bring you good data. If there's something I'm missing, something you want to hear, text it to me, email it to me, go to AaronBChapman.com, look it up on my website, send me a message and I'll research it and get you some data. Thank you all.